Okay. Hello, everybody. Hi, everyone. My name is Zoe Burkholder. I am the host of our workshop this afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us. We are just absolutely thrilled and excited to be here. Uh, this is going to be a great program. Uh, the title of our program today is Centering Asian American and Pacific Islander Women in U.S. History. And this is going to be a workshop that is intended for folks who are currently teaching in schools and educators more broadly in museums and historic houses and other places, as well as students at Montclair State who are pursuing um, professional degrees and careers in education. So thank you and welcome to our program today. Um, I have just, I'm doing a screen share. You should be able to see um, the screen, the slide that I'm uh, sharing right now. Yes, nodding is good. Okay, good. Um, so our program is broken up into a couple of different parts today. So for now, while you're welcome to have your camera on, if you like, you don't need it on for this portion of the program. And we might ask you to turn it on a little bit later. But if you prefer, uh, if you're comfortable, you're welcome to turn your camera and your mic off for a little bit. And instead, what we'd like to invite you to do is use the um, chat box. So to start, if you'd like this afternoon to drop a little note in the chat box and introduce yourself, tell us who you are. And if you like why you're here, we'd love to hear from you. In the meantime, I have dropped a link in there that you also see on the screen in front of you, which goes to our program for today, which is just a Google Doc that you should be able to access. So, uh, so far so good. Wow, we have lots of people here. This is excellent. All right, let's go ahead and get started. All right. Um, I wanted to open with a couple of words this afternoon about why we're here and also what it is that we're going to be talking about. So we're going to be speaking this afternoon about efforts to improve and increase the visibility of Asian American and Pacific Islanders in the US history curriculum and in our teaching more broadly. So in history classes and lessons, but also in other parts of the curriculum as well. Um, so I looked up this afternoon before our program to kind of check some stats and information on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. Now, as many of you probably know, the term Asian American itself is a relatively new one that dates to the late 1960s and refers to people from many different countries, uh, many different ethnic groups who speak different religions and cultures. Um, currently, we have a record 22 million Asian Americans uh, living in the United States today, as well as 1.4 million Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders. So we have a very large and very diverse uh, portion of the US population that we're gonna be talking about this afternoon. And really the question is, how to create a more inclusive curriculum in many places and in many examples, we really need to kind of update the way that we are teaching about Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders in the curriculum. Now, some of you probably are aware that just this spring in January, um, the governor of New Jersey passed a new law. And this law actually requires K through 12 public school teachers to include Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders in the curriculum. And New Jersey is not the only state that has been involved in this work to expand the curriculum and to make sure that teachers are doing their best to include Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. And so one of the questions I think it's worth considering is why? Why is the governor requiring um, an expansion of the curriculum. What is the point of mandating this in terms of state law? And to answer that question, we can look at increasing examples of violence, intimidation, harassment, and bias against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. So the data on the screen in front of you comes from the Pew Research Center and gives a sense of some of the ways that we have um, increasing not only examples of violence and discrimination against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, but also an increasing sense of 
unease and disquiet among different people in this community. So for example, a majority of Asian Americans say violence against Asians is increasing in the United States. So that's, as you can see, 63%. Um, with 19% saying it's staying the same. So there's really a significant uptick in how people are interpreting and um, viewing their, their safety. They worry that they might be threatened or attacked because of their race or ethnicity. Again, those numbers are very disconcerting with lots of majority of people responding that they feel that they might be threatened or attacked because of their race or ethnicity. And as you can see, um, a fair percentage of people, 36% of people of Asian Americans who responded to this survey said that they have made changes in their daily schedule or routine in the past 12 months because of that worry. So for example, picking a different way to commute to work or engaging differently with people in public settings. Um, so people are making serious changes to their lives and these concerns are very real. The final piece of evidence down there um, of Asian Americans surveyed, they believe their local elected officials are doing um, a very good or a very bad job dealing with violence against Asian Americans. Very or somewhat good is only 19% of the population surveyed, whereas very or somewhat bad um, was at 43%. I think, I mean, honestly, this is why Governor Murphy has passed a law in New Jersey mandating um, an expansion to the curriculum. And this is not an uncommon or unusual response. You can go back all the way into the 1940s when um, different communities started to pass laws mandating tolerance education for Jewish populations in the United States during World War II, that when a community in this country feels threatened, we as a, as a country turn to education and turn to public schools particularly to try to address some of the concerns of people in that community and to try to increase tolerance, increase understanding and reduce bias in the population. So it's interesting, I think, to think about um, that is one reason for expanding the curriculum. And then there are many other reasons to expand the curriculum. And some of these are more positive. For example, trying to recognize the diversity that we have in our classrooms and our communities, trying to bring in the lived experiences of our students and our community members into the classroom and trying to create, I mean, we talk about inclusive classrooms, but it really takes a lot of work to make that happen. So expanding lessons on Asian American and Pacific Islanders is an important way to um, really, I think, modernize and improve the curriculum. And today I'm excited because we've decided to focus this panel specifically on bringing in the experiences of women. So we're doing kind of double duty in this workshop, imagining that we can really help teachers think more broadly um, about teaching Asian American and Pacific Islander history by bringing in, in our short lesson today, only an hour and a half, uh, the perspectives, experiences, and ideas of women in particular. So uh, it is my pleasure to share our schedule with you today. We have a two-part program. The first part of our program is going to be a panel, um, and Dr. Sumi Hagiwara is going to be hosting that panel. She is our Acting Associate Dean for Academic Affairs in the College of Education and Human Services here at Montclair State University, and an Associate Professor in the Department of Teaching and Learning. She is an expert in STEM education, that's science, technology, engineering, and math. And her work has a focus on equity in computer science and science education, especially how language, culture, and identity play a role in education in and out of the classroom. So I'm gonna be handing over the program to Sumi in just a minute and her panel that she's brought together with us today. But before I do that, I wanted to introduce our second um, 
uh, educator here today who is going to be Ms. Marianne de Padua, who's joining us this afternoon from the New York Historical Society. Marianne de Padua is the Assistant Manager of Professional Learning at the New York Historical Society, which, by the way, is a fantastic museum in New York City with an awesome kind of kids section of the museum. And if you haven't been there and if you're looking for something new to do with your family, I highly recommend it. Uh, Ms. de Padua, is a full-time professional educator and she creates custom professional development workshops for K through 12 teachers for groups in uh, New York City and the surrounding area. She's also, aren't you a native of New Jersey, Marianne? I am South Jersey, born and <laughs> She's raised. a native of New Jersey <laughs> and she loves coming to Montclair State. So we've done a lot of work with her. We're very lucky to have her. Uh, her most recent work includes serving as a project associate for the launch of WAMS, which is Women in American History. What does that stand for, Marianne? Women in the American Story. It's our women's history curriculum. Women in the American Story. Um, and she's doing uh, the WAMS Ambassadors, a national teacher training program centered on U.S. women's history. So uh, we're going to start um, with Dr. Hagiwara this afternoon. And so I'm going to pass the microphone over to her. Dr. Hagiwara, I have um, one more slide that has a photograph um, that goes with your panel. So I'm just going to advance to that slide and pass the mic over to you. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of you for joining us here today. Thank you, um, Zoe. Um, and thank you all for joining us. Um, uh, just to uh, give us, uh, give you some context, the, um, uh, the experience of, I think, Asian, Asian Americans and really any, most, all of us really coming from other countries and identifying with being American and, and living in um, where we are, um, we have to talk about identity and, um, and how identities intersect. Um, and uh, so this panel piece is really to present um, more authentic stories and, and uh, accounts of how we respectively identify with being um, Asian and American. Um, and and segue into uh, Marianne's uh, presentation. So I'll just uh, uh, have my colleagues introduce themselves. So, So Young, would you like to start? Sure, I am. Um, my name is Dr. So Young Lee. I am an associate professor in family science and human development. And I've been here at Montclair since 2009. And I, uh, study mostly Korean families, Korean Americans or immigrants uh, who are living in the US, but at the same time, Koreans in South Korea, as well as other um, ethnic groups. Uh, should I just keep going and then come back or come back? Me, yeah, let me, um, uh, we'll continue with the other introductions and I'll pose the, the question that will guide our conversation. Um, Sharon? Hi, I'm a doctoral fellow here at Montclair State. I'm an immigrant educator from Hong Kong and Singapore and an American citizen. I taught ESL as an adjunct at Sacred Heart University in Connecticut and Monroe College in New York. My research interests include AAPI teachers and AAPI inclusive curriculum. Great, thank you. And um, Andrea. Um, hi, I'm Andrea. I am currently a senior undergraduate at Montclair State University studying music. Um, for the past two years, I've been serving as the president of the Unified Asian American Student Organization, also known as UASO, on uh, MSU campus. And through my time here, um, the goal of UASO is to unify the Asian American community and spread awareness of Asian and Asian American culture to the MSU community. Great, thank you. And um, just to uh, sort of preface Marianne's presentation, I thought we'd start our sort of panel conversation with a question um, that intersects our identities as being Asian and female. And so if you can each uh, share in your lived experiences, what does that mean? What does that intersectionality mean for you um, and, and where we are and in the time in which we are living um, as Asian American women? So Young, would you like to start? Sure. Well, we don't have much time, so we cannot talk about too long about this, but um, I've been here in the U.S. since 2001 uh, as a doctor student, and uh, since then, it's been 
my identity has changed. So, so I was a single woman from Korea who barely speaks English, um, all those things. And they became um, professors at certain universities and moved around. And then now I became a mom to married and then mom. So my identity as an Asian woman, as a single person and a student is very simple actually. You just study hard, right? You became as a, um, to become a doctor, uh, to get a doctor degree. But then when my life goes on and I add on more hats on my life, uh, it becomes more um, complicated. So as a single mom, I mean, not a single mom, single women, I had to protect myself. Now as a mom who has a, a Asian daughter, I have to protect my daughter's identity too. So that becomes my um, major priority. Throughout that experiences, um, my accent, you can hear my accents as a South Korean. Uh, and then that defines me as who I was. And then through that accent, and then I, if you see me in person, I'm a very tiny uh, woman. So I am short and then uh, you can guess, um, or maybe not, but that becomes uh, another definition of who I am. And then through that, I kind of experienced some kind of microaggression, if you have heard about that term. At the same time, people expect me to be a model minority. And then I became a uh, representative of all Asian groups, especially East Asian groups. So, so whenever I go to a group, uh, when uh, there are not many Asians uh, exist, then people ask me all kinds of questions you know, as if I know everything. So that's the kind of one of one part of my life. Um, I try to break that myth or stereotypes, but it's very hard. It has to be bi or multi um, relationships uh, in that sense. At the same time as a mother, uh, my daughter uh, used to say that my hair color is the prettiest, which is a black hair. And then she was kind of uh, interested in why she's not, because she's also a biracial uh, kid. So um, sometimes uh, kids are innocent enough not to have that kind of stereotypical uh, ideas about how uh, Asian Americans are experiencing uh, the lives in the US. But as she becomes more aware of the situation and some uh, incidents that she kind of experiences. I have to think about how Asian mom should parent our children to make sure that they are confident about their um, who they are as a part of Asian families, but at the same time, how to protect themselves. And unfortunately, through many researches, that hasn't been done much compared to the other uh, ethnic groups. So that became uh, my part of protective mom, but at the same time, Asian uh, researcher uh, mission in uh, my professional side. So I'm going to stop here because I know that the time is limited. Thank you, so young. Um, yeah, and you, you shared um, a number of points that I think I, I almost wanted. I wish this could be a longer dialogue. Um, and what we can do that uh, another time. But um, Sharon, would you like to, to continue? Yeah, so uh, thank you so much. And as you can see, actually, the photos that are on screen right now, um, they are my grandparents, my grandma and my grandpa. And my grandma is such a special lady. Um, she actually passed away just after Mother's Day on Monday morning. And it actually brought back a lot of memories uh, for me, uh, shaping me who I am today as an AAPI woman. And also that uh, highlighting that concept of intergenerational solidarity. So my grandma, my mother and I, we all married someone from a different country and a different culture. Um, I married an American and I uh, recently became an American through naturalization. Um, my grandma, she was originally from China and between the spring of 1959 to the end of 1961, it was during the worst uh, famine in China and most of her family uh, died during the time. And so my grandma, being a very resilient lady, 
she actually uh, alone, she went from China to Singapore. And that was when she met my grandpa, who is Singaporean and Malaysian. He was an admiral in the Navy at the time. Uh, they fell in love. They have four beautiful children, one of whom is my mom. My grandpa died at the age of 40 while he was on duty in Portugal. And uh, at the time, my mother and all her siblings were still at school. So my grandma took care of all four children while working as a cook at an elementary school in Singapore. And I remember as children, my sister and I, we would help our grandma out at the kitchen. Not so much helping, more like really stealing the food from her. Like we would just, uh, yeah, get a taste of all those food. And uh, she's a very stern lady. So she would like yell at us and like, we have to get back to work, don't steal the food. But by the end of the day, after uh, hard work, day of hard work, she would actually give my sister and I, you know, the yummy food that she actually made for the elementary students. And I just remember so vividly, uh, even now, like this is like happening, this happened many years ago, but I remember that kind of um, joy on each of the kids' eyes and the face as they tasted her food. Uh, in our family, food is love. And that kind of passed on, um, even uh, as I'm now here in the States, my daughter, we would make uh, dishes together and we would cook together. And um, I'm not as, as good as a cook as my mom and my grandma, but yeah, that, that kind of love and that kind of intergenerational solidarity and um, my grandmother's determination and strength is always there. Uh, why I talk about this is because my mother also, um, well, unfortunately, last year she was diagnosed with terminal breast cancer, mm -hmm. and she decided not to tell us until, um, yeah, until the doctor said it was terminal, and it was all happening all at the same time, uh, but even as a terminal cancer patient, she's a very strong lady, um, always asked me, like, yeah, are you doing okay? Are you taking care of yourself? Um, are you used to the weather in the States? She, um, as a Singaporean woman at the time, moving to Hong Kong, because my dad is from Hong Kong, she had to get used to a different type of weather, although both Asian cultures, she had to get used to that. And I remember the first time I saw snow in the States, I was shivering and I was reminded of how my mother was telling me, oh, Singapore used to be so hot and warm in the first winter in Hong Kong. Like I didn't prepare, I just brought t-shirts and shorts and flip-flops and uh, it was it was so cold and then I was thinking oh this is like another level of cold with the snow and everything uh, my mother my grandma they are both very strong women uh, even as my uh, grandma was dying my mother being a terminal cancer patient she's supposed to you know stay home and not go anywhere it was midnight she didn't listen to any of us so she just got on the taxi rushed to the hospital, um, hoping to see her and say goodbye. So my mother, my grandma, they showed me what being a strong, resilient woman means, um, what being filial means, because filial piety is also a very important core value in um, Asian culture. In Korean, it's called hyo. In Hindi, it's called zeva. For, forgive my pronunciation. In Chinese, it's um, in Cantonese is how. So it's a very important concept and it's something that I've been learning from my family. And um, I really hope to see more of that kind of representation, positive representation of Asian culture in the curriculum because unfortunately, uh, whenever there is a representation, usually it's more gearing towards the negative side. Like, oh, they, uh, the in Chinese immigrants came here to dig gold uh, for money but uh, missing the point of what actually happened, the lived experiences, why did our ancestors come here? Um, so I would definitely be looking forward to more positive representation of AAPI history and lived experiences and stories uh, in the curriculum. And I definitely encourage as educators, as teachers, or is to constantly encourage our students to share just the experience, um, the upbringing, uh, thereby really boosting the confidence in sharing the heritage and the legacy. Thank you, Sharon. Um, and you touched upon um, on a number of 
I think, uh, characteristics of the shared lived experiences of people who are people of color and people who have been marginalized or minoritized in, in, in society. Um, um, Andrea, did you want to um, continue and, and then we could do a quick uh, uh, discussion? Um, I'll add on to that a little bit. I feel a little bad following that because I have a little difficulty in finding out what to say. But um, I guess like talking about my personal experience. So I am also from South Jersey and primarily my town is um, predominantly white. So I wasn't really surrounded by a lot of Asians. Um, Growing up, I wasn't really exposed to the Asian culture until I started coming to Montclair. And ever since I became active um, in these cultural organizations, I really started to notice my presence as an Asian American woman. And I started thinking more about where both those terms stand in American society. And that, me that leading to understanding that I'm two, two different types of minorities as a woman, and as an Asian, and I, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I'm like trying to form my thoughts with this. Um, I think as during my time being um, the president of my organization, I think through um, understanding all of this and reading more into everything, I think my biggest takeaway um, intersecting these both of these identities is that. Um, to challenge all these social, social, so, social cultural aspects that make me who I am, because mm -hmm. we, um, as like being an Asian American woman, we were assigned to this life, and it's unfortunate that we are unfortunately assigned to disadvantages of being an Asian American woman in the U.S. Because, um, as um, mentioned in US history, Americans do have like an assigned privilege or related privilege with everything. And it is unfortunate to like know that. So um, yeah, um, ever since then, I have been trying to make my presence known, especially as being an Asian American woman in a leadership position that used to be predominantly held by men. Mm -hmm. um, it's important for our presence to be known. And like, I do want to touch upon what Sharon brought up with um, with Chinese immigrants coming to the gold rush. Um, I, I hope that um, the, you, the US um, educational system could highlight more about immigration history rather than focusing on the perspective of Americans viewing immigration from others. Yeah, and I think, you know, you raised some excellent points as well, um, Andrea, and especially, you know, as um, Sharon had mentioned um, is, some of what we know about Asian American history or Asian history in in the in the states is is are really the sound bites of the gold rush or the internment camp, um, and there's so much more to the Asian American identity than these um, what is historical, but it's also it's an incomplete story, right? Um, and to quote Chimananda Diche, single story TED Talk is that. Um, we have to be very cautious about the stories that are being told um, and that often these stories, while they may or may not be authentic or true, um, they also present a very um, uh, limited scope of the complexity of, of the, the history. I mean, can you imagine just the, the task is to teach the history of of a population. Um, and it's really it can't be just captured in um, these sort of uh, these um, um, incidents or in, um, instances in society uh, that um, that are retold and 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 retold, you know, in the history book. So yes, I, I agree that I hope that um, as we move forward with crafting um, a curriculum or understanding of what Asian American history is in the United States, that it is beyond just um, some of these. Um, historical you know, milestones or along a timeline because there's so much more that happens in between. Um, I wonder if so young in your experience of working with um, uh, Korean women is particularly in this area of New Jersey where there is a growing Korean um, uh, uh, population. I mean, what are some of the, what, what, what are some takeaways that you've seen from your research of what 
needs to be represented in, in curriculum, particularly for um, the Asian population or Korean population here? Um, there are several, but because of the time limitation, I'm going to point out some. So first of all, um, Dr. Berkheimer uh, said it's that Asian population is a really big population. And uh, when we talk about Asian Americans, um, people used to think that like there's only one group. So I want uh, many of you think that it's very, very different and diverse groups by ethnicities, by uh, within even commu uh, Korean communities. There are a lot of variation there in their lives. So sometimes because of the, uh, the modern minority issues, uh, myth that people think that Koreans are do well with the math. Koreans do well with uh, in socioeconomic status. The Koreans do well, so they don't need any help. But that's not really true. So uh, make sure that if you are teaching um, students, they are another individual. You have to kind of sensitize it to the differences and then make sure that what they need. And because of some kind of uh, social pressures and ideas about uh, Korean immigrants, they tend not to look for a support system. They try to keep them um, their own weakness inside or sometimes because of language issues and everything. So it will be really uh, appreciated if you kind of have a genuine conversation with the uh, Korean um, immigrants and then find out what they need. So I'm gonna again stop here. Um, thank you, thank you, Soyoung. And then Sharon, you had talked about um, the filial piety and spoke about you know your grandmother and your mother's uh, strength and and resiliency. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if how you see other sort of cultural influences um, in uh, shaping your identity as as an Asian female, um, especially in after you know having your mother and grandmother. Uh, as role models for you. So I'm an English language learner and growing up um, I was, uh, because I was growing up in Hong Kong, which is also a former British colony, I was actually told by teachers that English is the most important language. You need to speak English either with a British or American accent. Um, yeah, no other types of English should be spoken, but in observing interactions uh, with my mother and grandma, there's all different languages always going on at the same time. Uh, there would be Malay, there would be Cantonese, there would be some English, uh, yeah, all mixed together. And um, I think this kind of diversity in languages is really what shaped me because I'm not just uh, learning English, but I'm also trying to catch like different phrases in Malay, different phrases in, in Cantonese, in Mandarin, and uh, trying to really connect to my family as much as I can. And uh, with my daughter now uh, studying in K to 12 American schools, right, public schools, I'm also trying to tell her uh, that, you know, uh, we came from this background and we would like you to get connected with your ancestors, with your grandparents, as she's learning Cantonese from me. Um, what we try to, uh, not very successful, but we're trying to really uh, connect to our culture, our yeah, ancestry with languages. Sometimes it is hard. Sometimes uh, I would, like, especially with my daughter, I would try to talk to her in Cantonese in front of her friends. She would say, mommy, don't, yeah, don't, don't embarrass me in front of my friends. Um, I, I do think that, yeah, um, encouraging our students, encouraging our children that actually to be bilingual, to be multilingual is actually a strength. It's nothing to be ashamed of and that everybody speaks with an accent um, and all accents are beautiful, all accents are precious. Um, that's very important because growing up, I definitely had that impression that whatever accent that I have is not good enough, it's not beautiful, but mm. we, we should really believe in ourselves, in our languages, in our culture, and the way that we speak is uh, fine and beautiful as it is. Thanks, Sharon. And um, Andrea, the, uh, Andrea, as a, as a uh, student growing up in, um, in Jersey and going to schools, 
um, that was predominantly white. What, what are some things that you wish your teacher would have known in order to sort of give you a greater sense of validation for your own, your, your identity um, as an Asian American? Um, what I wish um, uh, during um, growing up, what I wish that I experienced was just seeing more like representation of Asian Americans. Um, I think because I've like, now as a student, I've like I'm active on social media and do a lot of like advocacy through my organizations. I see that nowadays, like our community um, has been more represented in media, movies, books, but I think something that is missing for us is that how we aren't the lack of representation of Asian Americans in history. So I think through that, I think I, I would wish that my teachers would learn more about immigration history, like as mentioned before, rather than looking at Asian Americans through the American perspective. And I think what, I don't know if, what some teachers um, may not realize is that they have such a strong influence in teaching such young minds that are soon to be the future of our society. And from teaching US history, they also in a way define what it means to be American. And America, what I wish I learned then is that being American is not one solid definition of it. There's so many different, so many of us come from different backgrounds um, and ways we are raised by different immigrants and such. So, yeah. yeah. That's great. Thanks, Andrea. Andrea, the, um, well, uh, Zoe and Marianne, um, I'm wondering if we, this might be a good time to segue. I think that, that it's uh, the connections that I'm drawing across uh, so young Sharon and Andrea's stories is really looking at um, the Asian American history, um, not just as um, historical events, but rather from or layered with uh, cultural um, influences as well as uh, really, really thinking more deeply about what does that the Asian identity mean? Because as So Young had stated, being Asian, that category, that label, is certainly more complex than 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 just um, one uh, stereotype. It's it's uh, certainly uh, a very diverse and broad uh, um, identity to to carry um, in in the in social studies and in the history books. Wow, thank you, uh, Sumi, and thanks to all of the panelists this afternoon. That your panel was so good that Mary and I were Marianne and I were in the chat being like, let's give them more time. Yeah, yeah, let's give them more time. Like we could seriously, um, we'd love to hear from you all like for the next hour and a half. It's obvious you have so much to share in terms of your experiences and your research. Yeah. Yes, I forgot. There is a, after this event, um, there is an informal discussion group that um, we, uh, that I will be hosting. And um, I just shared the information with you in the chat box. Um, that is an open Zoom. So if you are free and interested in joining us, feel free to um, join us at 5.30. Great, thank you. And the, the link is in the chat, everyone. So young, Sharon, Andrea, thank you so much. And uh, Sumi, of course, thank you for moderating the panel. A really helpful introduction and reminder for all of us about why we're doing um, this work and, and why folks are here today, trying to, trying to do better and trying to learn more. And so without further ado, Marianne, uh, let me pass the mic over to you and you can lead us through some um, really specific examples of how to do this work better. So I see you, you're on Marianne. Hello and welcome and thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, Zoe, for having me and to our amazing panelists. I think I wrote down some notes um, and, and really, I was honestly tearing up a little bit because so much of what you were all saying has either resonated with my personal experience, especially from being from South Jersey. So Andrea, I can definitely relate to you. My mother's experience, I'm constantly telling her, your accent is beautiful. Please don't, don't feel ashamed of it. I love it um, and have learned to love it even more. Uh, and so 
I think all of you gave me a really wonderful transition to this need for historical representation. And I'm so happy that the historical society that my department, the education division has addressed that lack of representation uh, and really looked at the specific stories of Asian American uh, Pacific Islander women that I will share with you today. Um, it's not all of the resources we have on API uh, Women in History. I'm happy to say it has grown since uh, last year with our curriculum um, that uh, we are publishing more units of, and I'll get to that in a moment. But I do want to dive right into the resources. So pardon me, I have so many windows open. Um, to begin, I just want to invite all of you to turn on your videos if you'd like. It's, um, it's nice to see people's faces, though I respect uh, if you'd like to be anonymous, if you will, but please participate in the chat. I would love to hear from you. I have questions from for all of you as well, and then there will be a breakout rooms portion, so you'll be able to interact uh, and learn from each other along the way. So we're going to center API women in US history. I heard a lot about decentering the white American perspective, the Western perspective, and I hope that these resources um, enable you to start doing that in your curriculum and your classroom practice. I wanna ground our work today uh, in a land, land acknowledgement too. Acknowledgement is a simple, powerful way of showing respect and a step toward correcting and centering the stories and voices of those overlooked in history. With this land acknowledgement, we seek specifically to recognize indigenous communities. Regardless of where you are, you are sitting on land that has been colonized. Let us ground ourselves in this recognition and also uplift the names of these lands and honor the community members from the nations who reside among us. Today and always, because I live in Manhattan and I work in Manhattan, I honor this land called Lenape Hoking, home to the Muncie Lenape, the original stewards of this territory. Uh, I'm gonna share a link to a website called Native Land Digital where you can explore the land that you are on uh, after today's session. And to see all of the links for our workshop today, I have prepared a shareable document for all of you. So it looks like this. It has our session resources. It has um, has resources beyond our workshop today. I will add my slides, a PDF of my slides after uh, this session uh, into that document. So please feel free to lean on that. Um, and I will, Zoe and I will put some links in the chat box as well. All right. So I wanna hear a little bit from all of you. Um, if you can add into the chat your response to this question, what do you hope to learn from today's workshop about API women in US history? not grading you on your response. So feel free to be honest. Um, and that will help me kind of uh, emphasize certain parts of the primary sources. We have Christina. Uh, how we can incorporate this learning into various content areas. Yes, uh, even beyond API Heritage Month, this is US history. So uh, we like to say at the Historical Society, Women's History Month isn't just the only time we teach women's history, it's every day, same with API stories. Uh, Helen, uh, I honestly do not know much history about API women. Just came here to listen, learn, and see where I can get more resources. I think that is such a wonderful place to start. Um, we have Ramilas. I'm sorry uh, if I pronounced your name incorrectly. Please feel free to correct me. Um, I'd like to learn about how API women in history intersected with other ethnic groups, moments of solidarity. Oh, I'm sorry, Jamie. 
Thank you. Uh, Dawn, I hope to learn ways to seamlessly incorporate the stories of API women into the curriculum. Great. Okay, so learning to be more culturally inclusive, responsive to our students. Uh, Jennifer, nothing specific. Oh, your high school math teacher, wonderful. We do have some stories of API women uh, who um, were educators, were working um, as scientists, were working in the military. So I think one thing I heard from the panel is the story isn't static about APIs in uh, the US. It is very dynamic. It is very much diverse in and of itself. Great. Okay, so I hope that this workshop starts to address uh, the things that you are looking for. Um, the curriculum I'm sharing doesn't have all of the stories, but it's a great place to start. Uh, I always share the set of group norms. If you could take a moment to please uh, have a look, this will be a great way just to set the, um, I guess the parameters of how we'll, we'll interact with each other and these resources. Okay, and feel free to do a digital thumbs up, an actual thumbs up, say yes in the chat. Can we agree to these community protocols while we are together? Amazing. Amazing. Please have those responses uh, in the chat. I love that uh, you are talking to me. That's always lovely. And our essential questions for today, where does Asian American and Pacific Islander history appear in the classroom? How can the resources from this workshop provide us with a deeper understanding of the influences and contributions of AAPI women and the communities they are a part of? And then how can we as educators amplify the stories of AAPI women and communities to our students? And I would also say ourselves, we are constantly as educators learning. And so I am also here to support that. And that is the wrong slide. One second. Ah, okay. See, that is the right slide. So we have talked about personal stories. We have uh, heard from the panelists about moving through the country as Asian American uh, women. So I want to establish with all of you um, the rather the myth of immigration in the United States through this document, through this poem that maybe you are familiar with. Has anyone ever heard of the New Colossus by Emma Lazarus, published in 1883? Some of us have, amazing. That's okay if you haven't. Um, I, I know the, the famous stanza, which I bolded uh, on the screen, and I have two screens, so don't mind me if you see the side of my face. Um, Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless tempest toast to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. I've also bolded some really interesting words I thought when I was reading through this. Mother of exiles, worldwide welcome, a mighty woman with a torch. What images come to mind when you hear, read those words, this poem? And what is the saying about immigration to the US? You're welcome to respond in the chat. The US as a place of asylum. And Lee, that is such an interesting word to choose asylum, really a safe haven for what's happening, has always been happening globally, destabilization, wars, famine, lack of economic opportunities. That's what I think of when I hear going to a place of asylum. 
Christine, I thought about the Statue of Liberty, exactly. This, uh, the stands I believe is on the pedestal of the Statue of Liberty. And so the imagery is, is very much uh, aligned with the poem, it's first the makes sense. It seems as if immigrants are welcome. Oh, I'm so glad you mentioned, Don, that the Chinese Exclusion Act was passed in 1882. Um, and so this poem, among many things in US history, is ignoring that reality of immigration itself. And the Chinese Exclusion Act um, essentially defined immigration as an exclusive policy. Sarah, that the US ought to be a place of asylum, ought to be, yes, those key words there. It should be, it is um, framed as, but is it actually? It definitely looks at the US as a country of immigrants, but whose stories are being left out in uh, constructing that narrative of the US? Who isn't being discussed in a country of immigrants? Um, and feel free to answer that uh, if you'd like. So going back to our panelist, I, I do want to put back into the space that idea that the history isn't uh, complete, right? Because being Asian American, we are not isolated from the Black community, the Indigenous community. And so how do we bring the story of immigration to the larger story of America? Non-settler families are often overlooked, so we have um, everything happening all at once, groups existing all at once, struggling, finding success. And how do we begin to even unravel the complexities of immigration itself and see it um, as part of the country as a whole? One way that we always um, start this process is through a visual inquiry exercise. Uh, and maybe that you've done something like this before, maybe you've gone to an NYHS PD, um, we always empower teachers and thereby our students using uh, to be investigators of history using these three steps. So I will lead you through that. Um, I also want to say any of the sources I share with you are supplemental. And so I recognize you don't have all the time in the world to just do inquiry, but maybe after this, you'll try it. Um, you'll try one resource in this fashion. So the first part is to observe, and that's really the crucial part of it. I would say suspend everything that you know about a source or about a topic. And in this way, we are starting from a place of equitability. So whatever your students know, whatever you know, that is more than enough. Because what we are gonna do in the first part is just observe, just uh, respond to what we see. As the facilitator, I'm gonna guide you through part two, strategic questioning, and sprinkle in historic context. And then part three, together we will draw conclusions and make inferences about the time period and, and for our workshop, what this tells us about uh, AAPI history and Asian American Pacific Islander women. Um, I first wrote this workshop uh, last year and we got teacher feedback about an illustration that um, I will show you that does have racist stereotypes and I really appreciated the, um, the feedback to include a content warning. So I'm going to share with you what our team has written uh, in response. So the following primary source includes racist and stereotypical imagery and language. We as educators recognize that it was racist, offensive, and disturbing at the time of creation, and that it continues to be so today. By exploring this content, we aim to acknowledge how Asian American and Pacific Islander groups were mistreated historically and provide historic context for the stories of resilience we will explore throughout the rest of this workshop. I think it was uh, one of our panelists who, who expressed, I wish my teacher knew this about AAPI history. Um, and so that's why many of you are here today, but I also uh, want to encourage uh, learning how to sensitively 
share these topics and also be mindful that a lot of these topics, a lot of these stories contain so much trauma, intergenerational trauma. And so one way we can start to be just more intentional, I think, uh, is providing this um, moment of reflection through this content morning. So I wanna give you all a few seconds to just silently observe this image. And I will call time and have you contribute observations in the chat. But for now, just have a look. Okay, everyone in the chat, please tell me one thing that you are seeing. It could be words, it could be um, the mood of this source. It could be anything in the background. Condescending is putting it too lightly disproportionality. Can you be more specific uh, with these? What is telling you that it is condescending? What is telling you that there's a disproportionality? A man with dark skin washing the window in the background. Labels on the kids that are on the bench being scorned. Chinese and Native Americans are not even allowed to go to school. How do you know that, Lee? What is, where do you see that? So many stereotypes in one in one picture, yeah. We have, can you tell me more about this juxtaposition of power? Who is in power, who is not? Um, indigenous uh, folks in the back corner being ignored or figure, excuse me. I think the book uh, that the Native American child is reading is upside down, what, what might that be saying? This is an illustration, an artist is making choices, is being intentional. Okay, the person in power is much larger, the doorway with the stereotypical Chinese braid, ponytail. Ironic how the board in the background discusses consent for advancing the world civilization. I wanna come back to that word consent. It's a really interesting part, I think of this um, primary source. That is from the Library of Congress, and in the doc, it is uh, linked in there. The woman in the back holding the book upside down. The US must govern its new territories with or without consent until they can govern themselves on the blackboard. So what do you think this phrase um, is saying about the US, or rather not about the US, what is this phrase saying about the people the U.S. must govern? What is civilization who is capable of learning it? Who gets to be considered civilized, right? Uh, intentionally making a white male bigger and shown as an authority figure. And take a look at the clothes that the uh, larger figure, the white man is wearing and what that is saying. Uh, Reminds you of manifest destiny, yeah, but compared to, and compared to the image of the Columbia figure holding a torch saying that we need to bring civilization, this is a different setting uh, in a very imperialist time, more or less. Belief in social Darwinism, they think they need to come in and take over when re in reality civilizations uh, we're doing fine, probably better until the US government takes over. Yeah, so I think what I'm hearing from your comments, your observations and diving deeper into it. So we just went to step two without me even saying it, um, is that these 
students who are being reprimanded, um, can any of you name the countries that you are seeing in this? They are told to be civilized, that the US has to be essentially that teacher and really they are the, the gate holders for civilization. The Uncle Sam is indicative of the US mentality that the US is best, that it knows best, right? So what are the clues, what are the cues being absorbed by whole countries, whole API countries being annexed by the US uh, that white supremacy is um, in power and um, this is where they are relegated in US society says if they wanna be American, they must conform to the white man's America. If they can't, they aren't allowed in. Okay, so we can talk about this so much. Um, yes, Don, Philippines, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, Cuba. This illustration is from 1899. So the Spanish-American War has just ended. Um, the US negotiated with the first imperial colonists power Spain and then annexed uh, these countries. Um, and so this illustration comes from Pop. It is a popular humor magazine. And so it's, it's so complex and sophisticated in a way of the commentary it's making. On one end, it's so sarcastic. These are caricatures. On the other hand, if it's satire, it might also be saying or really shedding light on the attitudes of the US, which some of you already noted. They have their arms folding, resisting. Yeah, so how does this illustration really capture that? Um, that resistance, but also that oppression. And um, we often talk about this idea of the crisis of colonization. It, it isn't over, it's just manifesting in different forms. So here's a moment in 1899 where this very popular magazine is making a comment on it. Well, how might this history impact the present day experiences of Asian American and Pacific Islander communities? It portrays resistance as childish not to be taken seriously since they don't know any better. Anything else? Yeah, I, I can definitely see that interpretation. It's really um, putting them in their place, so to speak. And the fact that these are whole countries, cultures, um, and what, and I always wonder what gets lost in the process of Americanizing, not just countries, but individuals too. Does this tell us anything else about how this history impacts us and our students? Like indigenous people sent to boarding schools, the US will make assimilation a part of the policy which conveys the message that the cultures of others is not, not important. It sets up a tradition from of people from these countries to be outsiders, the perpetual foreigner. Yeah, and really looking at any culture beyond um, what was, what is the established dominant culture and established by force, I should say too, uh, as being less than inferior. It's a room full of immigrants, but the only ones who will ever be accepted are the Euro immigrants, right? And they are portrayed as the, um, reform students in the back. And I also want to note that many of you looked at um, the figure who is representing a caricature of uh, Black Americans washing windows of an indigenous character uh, holding a book upside down of um, representative of a Chinese immigrant as um, being kept out. So really still hinting at that era of exclusion. This is an era of Jim Crow that's happening. Um, this is a time of such violence on black communities, indigenous communities, and who we now say are Asian communities. Assimilation equals annihilation. At its most extreme, um, there is annihilation at multiple levels, right? So our culture, our language, our histories, um, the countries itself and resources. 
So we can go really deep with this one source. You can do this kind of exercise with their, your students. And of course, um, you know your students best, so you can scaffold it depending on where they are. Um, so we have looked at a historic source and it was very racist uh, and complex. Um, and before we get into resources that will definitely um, have students feeling empowered, I want to just bring in this quote by one of, uh, one of my favorite scholars who I've learned so much from about immigration, uh, May 9, her book, Impossible Subjects. She's a professor at Columbia University. And um, this quote, the theme of universal inclusion and citizenship could be read back onto the 18th and 19th centuries only by bracketing the conquest of Native American slavery, Southwestern annexation, Asiatic exclusion, Jim Crow, and the acquisitions of in unincorporated territories. So really all of the different stories we have um, mentioned uh, through this inquiry. Indeed, the experience of the new immigrants at the turn of the 20th century, as well as that generally of non-European migrants throughout American history was marked by exploitation in a segmented labor market, political exclusion, social isolation, and native opposition. Uh, so it's also crucial to think about if you're teaching civics, for example, how are Asian Americans part of that conversation? How have they defined it? How has um, Wong Kim Ark versus the US case defined the 14th Amendment um, and really shaped everyone who will be born in the United States as a US citizen, Asians and beyond. So there's so many ways to incorporate this in your classroom, uh, in your school's curriculum, in your state's curriculum. Um, for the interest of time, uh, I'm going to move us along to the uh, resources from Women in the American Story. Um, it, by next year, oh, by the end of this year, it will be a completed, though still very much a, a living, breathing curriculum of women's history from the 1400s all the way to 2004. It began uh, to address this very concerning statistic that only 13% of historical figures in textbooks are women. That is just not true at all. And so we have all of these resources for you uh, centered on women's history, diverse women's history. Um, and it is not anywhere near complete, but it is so extensive. And I hope that you will explore it after. We're gonna be looking at stories from three units. So Modernizing America, 1889 to 1920, Confidence in Crises, 1920 to 1948, and Growth and Turmoil, 1948 to 1977. So it will really take you into history that uh, is not so in the past, I would say. Uh, very quickly, I want us to uh, explore this image. What are you seeing? We're now looking at a photograph and not an illustration. And then how might these folks know each other? It is a workplace. Anything else? Who are they all looking at? People working in a law firm together. What makes you say that maybe they're in a law firm? Stacks of paper. Yeah, stacks Typing. of paper. The typewriter. <laughs> the typewriter. I think their outfits too, very businessy. They all seem very formal. They're all gathered around the woman with the phone. This one, I would say, if you're going to do an image like the Puck illustration, this is such a joy to work with because it is a real people. Um, and it is a very active situation, uh, scene, they're addressing something. It is very much a working place. It is the office of Patsy Tokimoto Mink of Hawaii, the first uh, 
woman of color who was a representative in Congress, uh, the co-author of Title IX for Equal Access to Education, uh, institutes that are federally funded. And so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Patsy Mink. How many of you have heard of her before? It's okay if you haven't. Okay, so after this workshop, you're gonna to have to teach her any chance you can. Um, so Patsy Mink uh, is a third generation sensei Japanese American. Um, she didn't originally intend to be in politics, but because she was denied so many work opportunities, because she's an Asian woman, because she uh, was in an, uh, married a white man and so is interracially uh, in an interracial relationship, she decided to do something about it and uh, then became very active in politics. Um, she became the first woman of color elected to the US Congress in 1964. And this was after uh, Hawaii became the 50th state of the US in 1959. Uh, she returned to the house in 1990 and would hold that office for the rest of her life. Um, at the Historical Society, we are about to launch our Title IX exhibit and she will be of course featured. So I hope that you can see that as well. She should have became a senator. I think she should have run for president, to be honest. Can you imagine um, her and then all of our um, API representatives in Congress now, which I have some stats on that, which I thought was just amazing to read. Um, I think I added it in the workshop link stock, but the 107th Congress uh, membership, there's a report. 21 members are Asian American or Pacific Islander Americans. Uh, 35 years ago, the 99th Congress, um, there were only five API representatives in the House and two in the Senate. Um, and then we have, of course, since this is New Jersey, the executive board, one of the executive board members for the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus is Representative Andy Kim of New Jersey, District 3. Uh, and so, yes, we've come far, but there's so much more to do. And I think Patsy Mink's story is so powerful um, and can really, as teachers, provide that um, representation for our students that it seems many of us are seeking. And I thought just this image of her is so powerful being the only woman of color uh, in Congress uh, at the, that time. And then it is easy enough to vote right and be consistently with the majority, but it is more often more important to be ahead of the majority. And this means being willing to cut the first furrow in the ground and stand alone for a while if necessary. Okay. Um, I want to make sure that you have some time in the breakout rooms to discuss the life stories that we asked you to read. If you didn't get a chance to read those, that's okay too. Um, they are linked in the document, um, but also um, it's been an exciting session. So if you also want to just use that time to also talk about what you're learning, how you've been feeling in this session, you can. Um, I think what we'll do I will just share the Padlet. Oh, thank you, Zoe. The Padlet is in the uh, chat for all of you. Um, and there are instructions. So for the interest of time, I am going to prioritize uh, all of you discussing the stories with each other. And if you have time, you can write on this Padlet. So I have discussion questions on the stories. Feel free to use any of them if you'd like. And then, are you seeing the Padlet okay? Okay, great. Had that moment where I'm like, I hope you're looking at the right screen. Um, but what events shaped this person's life? How did they respond to it? What themes, topics stood out to you? And then what new information or perspectives did you gain? And then how did these life stories inform our understanding of US history, right? The goal is, the goal is to include these in, in US history, these stories. So how is it shaping your understanding? All right, everybody, I'm going to put you into breakout groups. Let's see. Um, okay. 
Okay, there will be eight breakout groups. And I'm going to give you at least seven minutes to start for now and then extend that time most likely. Okay, so I'm gonna open the rooms now. And Zoe, is it okay if I pause the recording while folks are in the breakout room? Yes, absolutely. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Okay. We are all here, possibly. Okay, nonetheless, we have about two more minutes. So let us conclude that workshop. Um, I hope you were able to have um, some good conversations about the life stories. And I would just love to know, how did these life stories inform your understanding of US history? No worries, Sarah, thank you for being here. Have a great concert. If anyone wants to add a response to the chat, um, this last question, how did they, how did the life stories inform our understanding of US history? Oh, Candace, I'm glad you had a great group. It is sad that um, people are denied opportunities uh, because of their background. And, and here, I think often we see the through line for these stories is that uh, out of that oppression came a lot of advocacy and resilience and, and really, um, whether intentional or not, being a leader in cultural and gaining cultural citizenship and claiming a sense of belonging uh, for API women in the United States. We discussed Mary Yamamada, amazing. So we have a perspective of what does it mean to serve in the US military uh, during World War II? There's a very common story of immigrants trying to improve their lives and make sacrifices uh, time away to be successful. Yes, definitely. And you know that folds so much into the American story of, of working uh, so much, sacrificing so much. But then what is the, you know, the nuance there for Asian, uh, Asian communities, APR communities, excuse me. You all encouraged us to go beyond policy and historical events and learn how to share personal stories of real people through their voices. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I know this part of the program would not have been as powerful without our amazing panelists. So I just wanna say thank you for giving me so much to connect uh, our resources to. Um, and then finally, uh, before I pass it back to Zoe, uh, these final reflections, uh, what is one thing you learned today that you are looking forward to incorporating uh, in your teaching and how might you use the resources from WIMS in your curriculum? Uh, what is one source you're excited to share with your students as early as tomorrow? So the questions are in there. The links have all the promo things that I wanna share with you so that you can stay in touch with us. And I'm gonna pass it back to Zoe. Thank you all. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much, Marianne. That was really just absolutely brilliant. And um, I'm, I'm hustling around over here trying to get those links together. But I promise if you are registered for this workshop and you entered your email into a registration link, we are going to send out um, copies of these links again to your email so that we can make sure that everyone has them. Um, in the meantime, we do have a professional development certificate available uh, for teachers who are here today. So let me drop the link one more time. 
in the chat box. So this one is going to be just a certificate. Um, if your administration is uh, willing to document your, your hours and count that for you today, we're happy to provide documentation of your participation in our workshop here at Montclair State University. Um, so we will be following up not only with a link to the resources that we've shared with you and used with you here today, but also um, with a copy, a link to the recording of this session. So the session has been recorded. And once we get it kind of finalized and edited, that will be something uh, that we can share with you in case you have any colleagues who are uh, interested in seeing the program, but they missed it here today. So uh, with that, I think we've run out of time. Please make sure, um, Sumi, if you're still with us, would you mind dropping in one more time the link to the program that you have, that you're hosting after, if you're still here? Um, if not, I'll have to go look it up and I'll drop it in in a minute. But uh, there is a kind of uh, discussion that is taking place hosted by Montclair State University on Asian American and Pacific Islander experiences. And um, there it is to continue the conversation. Uh, please do consider joining us there. It is uh, open to everyone and we'd be happy to have you join us there. I will now say thank you and goodbye. You all know how to contact me if you need me. Otherwise, I will be following up with an email that has all of my contact information as well as Marianne's contract information. So thank you for coming. Have a wonderful afternoon, everyone. And um, we hope to see you again at a program at Montclair State University. Goodbye.